Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to share this work with you. My name is Bernardo Suarez. I am a PhD candidate on urbanism at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. I present this paper as part of an investigation on counter-hegemonic forms of urbanization. In the relations of production of space, it recognizes the planetary urbanization as enclosed by a range of contradictions in order to become a variety of conflicts. Although, by means of dialectics, we can also observe attempts of resistance composed by principles of social participation. And, in its turn, the insurgency of social forces composed by popular, emancipatory and collective movements on the construction of cities, finally recognizing the notion of common. Taking the Marxist approach on primitive accumulation on planetary urbanization, we understand a series of interventions by forces both from the state and the market, such as urban renewal, gentrification and removal process that fall upon especially on the form of settlements and favelas. Among most important contradictions of globalization regarding cities is the production of urban informality. The urban population and the informal settlements in developing countries presents an alarming picture. The informal population presents absolute growth. As a characteristic phenomenon of cities in the Global South, favelas constantly face those threats from both the state and the market. By the same time as a growing trend in the planetary urbanization, it is constantly sought as a way to access land and housing. In this tendency, what alternative do we have for the informal settlements, especially the favelas of the Global South? new alternatives urge to be fought and put into practice. As an empirical object, we take the model of the Favela Community Land Trust and its possible contribution against actions of dispossession, gentrification and removal and on guaranteeing land ownership, triggering new methods of language and participatory design for the urbanization of favelas. Originated from civil rights movements for community stewardships of land in, in the United States, the Community Land Trust has been multiplying since the 1970s and around the world. Nowadays, it is primarily used to ensure housing affordability. The CLT basically consists on separation between the land and the housing buildings on its boundary. Thus, the land is subjected to the collective control and ownership of the CLT, while the house is under the possession of the resident. But then we have a question. Is it possible to be adopted in the cases of informal settlements and favelas? We must consider the socio-economic differences between all those regional and global contexts. So the favela CLT is an attempt for providing secure hold on the land and housing in the cases of the informal settlements. By separating the land from the edification and the property between them, it is based on these elements, collective property on the land, individual property on houses, perpetual affordability, and community control. And it has been developed in three sampler communities in Rio de Janeiro, in one called Trapcheiros, we have done some work on discussion among local leaders and residents that principles above land and its title of, of property, basic needs and local potentialities against threats of gentrification and removal. The entire social organization demanded by the implantation of, fee of the FCLT has also been reflected in a great effort of social territorial organization of trapsheiros among local problems and needs that seek to be translated into imagery representations of a new place, created by residents them themselves and by technical advisory. But there is our theoretical and conceptual question, which is, well, it leads us to recognize that from its contradictions and conflicts, also dialectically, 
arise new forms of social participation between ethical functions of architecture and urbanism. A new urban common might emerge as a new paradigm based on democratization, collectivization and associativism, and it can be found in cases when land is produced by value in use, in the forms of autogestionate and autoconstructive experiences of housing. These autonomous elements can mean a, an alternative form of social property, with, which paves the way for a process of decommodification of land and housing. By democratic management over territory, independence from the state and resistance to the market, and transforming land into a collective property under non-profit management. Finally, we consider urban commons as a form of resistance to the planetary urban crisis, overcoming forms of appropriation of space through new methods of social production of land and housing based on the principles of autonomy, autogestion and participation. In this regard, I would like to leave you with a couple of, okay, of questions. How can architecture and urbanism contribute to this struggle? And what kind of language and design may we produce? Thank you. Creating geographies for capital accumulation and the reproduction of crisis. Switching capital into built environment is the most accomplished special manifestation of capital and actually architecture and urbanism are among significant agents actively involved in the process of fixing capital in the built environment. Since this process of spatial fix is mainly directed by the interplay between logic of capital and political agencies, reproduction of crises such as such as special inequalities, urban poverty, injustice, exploitation of nature, and so on, could be inevitable. To overcome the current planetary crisis and to construct an alternative urbanization that can provide more humanized urban life experiences, is to begin with considering the existing socio-special dialectic more instead of mere abstractions in the education as well as practice of architecture and urbanism. The architectural education that can integrate concrete realities of the context into its pedagogy through providing critical perspective can be accomplished in producing real possible solutions to the present crisis. In this respect, the ongoing study aims to critically examine the role that architecture and urbanism play in sustaining urbanization which leads to reproduction of contemporary crises. Moreover, insights into the possibility of forming a more challenging framework for practicing architecture and urbanism will be provided. As Harvey says, special forms and social processes have interpenetrations so that special forms contain social processes and social processes are special. The broader viewpoint of the existing socio-spatial dialectic per se provides a critical approach toward the built environment and its crisis. The crisis of different sorts from urban poverty, socio-spatial polarization, class determined fragmentation, marginalization of the lower social strata, to the exploitation of nature, all can be taken into account as the products of the processes of urban space production. Hence, as Lefebvre puts it, the understanding of the processes and the means involved in the space production, along with the social relations processes, is of significant importance. It is not possible to expect a more inclusionary, fair and free urban life experiences for all city dwellers, regardless of their social class, unless by moving beyond the visible current planetary crisis as the outcomes to the processes produce them. Contemporary process of urbanization, in fact, is wedded to what Merrifield best called it as the general law of capitalist accumulation. The production of space under capitalism produces different experience of urbanism for different social classes through constructing structures of advantages and 
exploitation that benefit the dominant class, together with structures of disadvantages and deprivations that alienate the rest of the society. Within this system, urban space and quality of urban experiences both become like a commodity for those who could pay for it. Capital is in a perpetual movement and major parts of this movement occur at the special level. Since capital mobility pattern is extensively rested upon exploitation, environmental problems across the urban space, where capital is in its most mobile form, can be witnessed. So, in the absence of any intervening action, space production under hegemonic command of capital and the state will be solidified and will reproduce crisis that leaves its profound impacts on the most vulnerable and poorest of the poor strata. As a part of planning and intervention to change the predominant pattern of space production that brings about crisis, is to highlight the social responsibility that the architect has to take on toward the society. Of course, this could be accomplished unless by making some changes in the architectural education to have sociopolitically responsive architects as future graduates. To this end, the attempts should be directed toward integrating architectural education, in particular design studios with insights from sociopolitical mechanisms that are engaged in production, reproduction and manipulation of urban space. The design project indeed should be regarded as a research project that requires a critical examination of the present socio-special dialectic. Then, building on the obtained critical examination, design project should be programmed concerning existing concrete problems of the society. The architectural practices could be liberating if embracing socio-political engagement, moving from the final outcome to the space production process and addressing the collective social well-being. Concluding thoughts. As long as the mode of space production is driven by the hegemonic command of capital and the state, monopolizing urban space for a small portion of society, wealthy elite, and their needs while marginalizing the poor can be a prevailing practice. The production of Socialist space necessitates the move from the urban space as an exchange value to the urban space as a use value. This is what Merrifield says. So, not the logic of capital, but socially driven mode of production that gives priority to the social choices is the most needed for the contemporary world. Reminding the architect to be aware of his her position and role not as a passive agent contributes to the current dominant mode of space production and subsequently the, the urban crisis come along with it, but as a sociopolitically conscious, responsive and active subject that engages in the very process can be the basis for inventing future in a different way. Thank you for listening. Hello, my name is Haral Apostavdaroglu. I'm a postdoctoral researcher and with my co-author, Professor Konstantinos Lalenis from the University of Thessaly, we present the post-democracy governance in refugee camps, unveiling the socio-spatial conflicts of refugee crisis in Athens and Thessaloniki. In the last five years, the majority of refugees that found themselves in Greece after the closure of the Balkan route and the prohibition of their passage in North European countries have been stranded in state-run camps located in the perimeter of Athens and Thessaloniki. There is a number of controversial issues linked to this program that concern the spatial and social condition and their impact on the quality of life in these camps. In this presentation, we focus our analysis on the spatial governance and argue that the refugee camps constitute a place where a post-democratic model is implemented under top-down policies and lack of public participation. Uh, about the concept of post-democracy, according to several scholars during the last few decades, 
in Western Europe, North America, under the impact of neoliberal hegemony and the gradual dissolution of ideological differences between mainstream parties, the democratic system has been marked by a remarkable shift to a post-democratic model of governance. Zwickendau considers the concept of, of post-democracy in relation to a post-political condition, highlighting that a post-democratic arrangement has replaced debate, disagreement and dissensus with a series of technologies of governing that fuse around consensus, agreement, account and symmetrics and technocratic management. The approach on post-democracy seems adequate to explain the regime of refugee camps which has been critically examined by several scholars who underline that camps consist places of exemption, regimes of marginality and spaces of discipline and governmentality. About the post-democratic governance in refugee camps in Athens and Thessaloniki, the refugee camps are places where life, social relations, mobility and dissensions are controlled and managed by a post-democratic apparatus. State mechanism of mechanisms of police, army and bureaucratic services, supranational institutions like the European Union, the UNHCR and international humanitarian organizations are responsible for the management of the newcomers. Yet, democratic processes like voting, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, participation in decision making are not included or prohibited. Thus, we argue that the refugee camps constitute an emblematic place of a post-democratic model of governance. Thus, we would like to emphasize three main points that communicate the post-democratic model of governance in these refugee camps. Firstly, the Greek state program of refugee camps did not follow standard procedures in the choice and assessment of the camp's locations, failing to take into consideration and include in the decision processes the local communities. Processes concerning the location of most of the camps in Athens and Thessaloniki followed a top-down model without consulting the host community not, nor the local municipality authorities. Secondly, the camps violate official urban planning legislation as they are built in non-residential areas. According to the local municipalities, land uses maps, the areas of the camps are designed for mainly industrial uses in which residential uses are prohibited. Furthermore, the camps are located in abandoned old factories and military camp sites far away from the city centers and cut off from social services. Thirdly, refugees are excluded from any form of involvement and participation in the management and governance of the camps. Although there is a rich variety of community participatory methods, toolkits and directions available for the design, planning and management of refugee camps, in the case of Athens and Thessaloniki, these have been remarkably overlooked. Finally, some concluding remarks. According to Esposito, the post-democracy is of, from that point onward the Kratos state of democracy no longer referred to the demos but to a bios or even to a genos. According to Aristotle, in a democracy, the demos, the people, is Kyrios, the governor. The refugee camps constitute emblematic spaces where the governance of Kratos of Genos replaced the demos. As we saw, the legitimacy of camps is based on the separation between the ethnic stranger and the ethnic citizen. Indeed, people with a different Genos nationality, as indicated in their passports, are stigmatized and excluded in the political, social and spatial margins. Consequently, a presupposition for the reinvention of demons entails the recognition of refugees as equal people who can participate in the planning and governance of their shelters. But at this point, we must emphasize that not only equality but also liberty is the sine qua non of co governance. Meanwhile, one of the main slogans used by refugees when they demonstrate in the camps says, Huria, Azadi, freedom now. Balibar's term, Ega Liberté, as the unity of equality and liberty, the former defined as the absence of discrimination and the latter as absence of repression, is appropriate here. We strongly believe that governance based on Ega Liberté could open new horizons for less discriminatory and repressive societies. Thank you very much. Recovering the city. Citizen empowerment towards a tactical urbanism. As planetary crises become ingrained into the everyday lives of city dwellers, 
it has become increasingly important to understand how the built environment shapes and responds to social injustice, environmental degradation, and economic inequalities, especially in cities. The increased mobility of the market-driven global economy, as well as environmental and conflict-driven migration, has left the built environment struggling to address social and spatial segregation that dictates modern-day urban governments. According to Henry Lefebvre, the city is the laboratory of humanity. As the planetary crisis becomes more centralized in cities, mainly due to growing urbanization that consequently generates excessive pollution and influences climate change, urban development has fostered social inequalities reflected in public participation. The increased amount of social, economic, and environmental pressures throughout history has rendered city dwellers invisible to the urban democracy, while modern capitalist agendas generate urban policies that yield results, such as the vulnerability of its inhabitants in cases of natural disasters and organizational crisis. The current 21st century has presented the opportunity for a rise in bottom-up and grassroots activism that start with civil participation and empowerment of the individual to the right of the city. Such contemporary cities are reflecting the connotation of power in most societal structures, represented by social hierarchies, according to the level of economic power that determines the influence of participation in the decision-making process. Sherry Armstein's social ladder of citizen engagement illustrates the metaphor for describing and evaluating participatory activities. It distinguishes different levels of participation in relation to influence of power that has been consistent in the structure of contemporary societies. For Einstein, the last level of this methodological ladder reflect the ideal empowerment of the community in the decision-making process, allowing citizen committees to delegate power and ensure responsibility for community development. Thus, tactical urbanism aligns with Einstein's main concept of citizen control, allowing people to shape their immediate surroundings. The phenomenon of tactical urbanism aligned with the sense of citizen empowerment from a bottom-up approach, separating the rigid urban development logistics from an organic response of a space ownership. Such approach can be evidenced in the street intervention at Rio Negro and Monteria in Colombia. Tactical urbanism holds that citizen engagement and, participat and participatory approach that are essential to establish community resilience through the development process and decision-making about actions and outcomes decided by the community during times of crisis. Habitants are capable of shaping their realities. I've seen the sense tactical urbanism, also known as do-it-yourself urbanism, as a low-cost temporary appropriation of the space, as evidenced in Utah, USA, that can facilitate a new form of collectivism and an effective mobilizer for systematic change, especially in the urban democracy idea. Reshaping and distressed city throughout a localized lens, such as the development of community garden, public installations, pocket parks, and street art, can encourage citizens to build self-reliance and reinforce social networks by transforming capitalist logic of never-ending growth and restoring primary needs of the citizen. Cities are, have become epicenters for individual and corporations that are interested in profiting from the economic benefit of the built environment at the expense of the city's inhabitants. With citizens in control, the urban structure no longer only accommodates neoliberal agendas, but it first focuses on the redistribution of power to citizens. Tactical urbanism is opportunity to confront the city and its current order by demanding power throughout unsanctioned activities that question the neoliberal structure, urban system, 
filling social, economic, environmental, and political gaps left by the lack of government support throughout grassroots design interventions. The city of the future and practice of urban planning and architecture it starts with a transition to a collective and ecological turn that is based on a lo localized experience which aims to re-engage communities and fulfill individual needs as part of an interconnected system. My name is Carlos Enriquez Diaz. As a member and representative of my group colleagues, I thank you for your attention. Hello, everyone. I am Beatrice Galimberti. I'm a student of the PhD program in urban planning design and policy of Politecnico di Milano. And my research is concerning the role played by uncertainty in the design process of public spaces in Europe. And while uncertainty and crisis are two keywords of our key time, they are almost sister, let's say. And that's why today I'm asking in front of you, what do you have to be careful about public space in the age of planetary crisis? Well, indeed, our current age of planetary crisis is a composite state, which is consisting of overlapping crises, which are expanding at different speeds. Roughly speaking, some of them are fast-evolving crises, while others are slow-evolving crises. Um, let's compare them to diseases. So, if we consider one by one each pandemic, each wildfire, etc., well, these are all examples of fast-evolving issues, and they are like a stroke, which, when it arrives, immediately shows its effects. The responsive to fast evolving issues are mostly limited to that specific issues, neglecting its interdependency with other crises. But if, working, if we work in this sense, the next stroke is just around the corner. Well, climate change and progressive erosion of social cohesions are examples of slow evolving issues, similar to a long degenerative disease, whose effects are at first mild thus often neglected, and the risk is not to feel the emergency. Moreover, actions in response to them rarely bring results in the short term. But as researchers and reflective practitioners, we ought to be aware and careful about the actions taken in response to fast evolving issues. Indeed, these rapid actions can be counterproductive in the long run. For example, facial masks are super useful against COVID, but they pollute the environment if not disposed properly. And let's consider the fast evolving issues of the COVID-19. Well, stay-at-home orders temporarily introduced restrictions in the use of public spaces. Within the same area, the restrictions are the same for everybody. But not all the population is equally equipped to live in a quarantine situation, nor to access public space and services. So how to avoid answer to this fast-growing issue, which damage rights such as the equal access of public spaces in cities? Well, I argue we need to be vigilant and keep working on the foundational issues of urban public space in our age of planetary crisis. Within my PhD, um, I'm working on the definition of the topicality of public space. Some of the aspects which emerged are foundational aspects, so are basic aspects which respond to fundamental human rights, as the one listed. And here I want to focus on the control in public space. And, well, actually control is not a new argument for studies on the production and management of public space. It has many forms. That's the digital digital one. Well, in connection to the disruptive spread of ICTs in the last 15 years, new forms of control have emerged. Um, they are based on digital and digital, uh, which is the union of the word physical and digital forms of uh, control and so means of surveillances. These are new forms that can be grouped, let's say, in two main families. Well, the first family is the one of locative media, for example, personal devices as smartphones, watches and tablets using GPS can be vehicles of unprecedented modes of surveillance connected to privacy and control. But actually, we explicitly give our consent to be tracked by location aware technologies. 
Mm, well, the second family is um, concerning the digital coding of discrete population. So um, facial recognition systems, for example, which pervade public spaces and particularly privately owned public spaces. Well, their use is not only for security issues, but more and more also for collecting information on users and for commercial activities surrounding public space. And unlike the locative medians, no consent is asked. To give an idea of the scale of the phenomenon, in 2019, London had more than 600,000 surveillance cameras, becoming the third largest city in the world in terms of quantity of cameras, and many of them use the digital coding of discrete population. So, in addition to these forms of direct control, there's a second level of control on which it is more difficult to be vigilant. Mirko Zardini calls it the control of data and manipulation of behavior, and Shoshana Zubov is emphasized that the real crux of the matter is who uses data and how. So, this is an issue for which national and international law are still loose, struggling to keep up with the pace of ICT's evolution. And, uh, well, the safety of control especially proliferates in public spaces and privately owned public spaces. It becomes a real and relevant issue to be careful about for architecture and urbanism researchers and practitioners in the way we inquire and shape public space and in the way we interact with stakeholders of the project. And uh, so after that, let's pass to conclusions. So when fast evolving issues almost monopolize the public discussions as practitioners and researchers, we need to remain even more aware of foundational spatial needs and rights. This is an ethical and deontological issues, um, but does it concern only practitioners? Well, as today, practitioners are increasingly called curators, facilitators, which feeds and support the design process in which other actors are involved as civil servants, activists, engaged citizens, other profession, other practitioners, etc. Well, um, altogether we must be vigilant on these aspects and architects and urbanists are called to become curators of this collective ethical carefulness. And this is uh, an effort that requires an inevitable shift from the current education and practice of architecture and urbanism. And thank you so much for your attention. Hello, my name is Sabine Lepere. I'm a socially engaged architect and urban planner. Uh, and I'm gonna present to you today a short version of the thesis that I presented uh, for the Master of International Action, humanitarian action and conflict from Uppsala University in 2020. So the idea started by um, thinking, okay, after a war, we need to, to rebuild and um, architects should be rebuilding. But um, actually when I did an empirical job search on humanitarian recruitment platforms, I realized that there is no architects jobs or when they are, um, they are only like engineers or, or very technical jobs. So my research questions uh, are what specific skills can professional architects bring to the humanitarian field in order to contribute to the success of post-conflict reconstruction efforts? And the second research question was what positive impacts can architecture and urban planning have on peace building processes? So we see here basically three um, porous domains of, of research. There is the social and humanitarian architecture. So I reviewed literature in that field. There is the humanitarian shelter and um, uh, displacement. So I reviewed literature in that field. And then I wanted to link those to peace building and, and conflict resolution field. And that's when I found uh, this um, author called Jean-Paul Lederach. Um, he's very influential in the field of uh, peace building and he talks about conflict transformation. Here is his um, a pyramid where he identified three different um, 
range of leadership from grassroots to top leadership. And he says that you can work towards sustainable peace via the improvement of relationship um, between those different levels and within each level. And that's where I make the hypothesis that both architects and humanitarian workers operating in this middle range uh, leadership can help improve the population within the grassroots and also link with top leadership in order to transform a conflict towards sustainable peace. So I took three different case studies. Um, they are very different, uh, three different parts of the world, three different um, uh, programs and, and timelines. They all take place in post-conflict settings. So we have uh, Rwanda, Colombia and Iraq. To start with the Butaro Hospital in Rwanda, I can quickly say that it was um, uh, the Butero District Hospital that uh, provides the Burera region with modern medical care since 2011. Um, and uh, of course the conflict in Rwanda was uh, the big genocide that happened in 1994. Um, the design and implementation process uh, was made by the non-profit organization Mass Design Group. It uses local materials, uh, it provided jobs to local craft craftsmen, but also the pride of participating in such a project for the common good. It also provides dignity to both the staff and the patients. My second case study is the city of Medellin in Colombia. It's the second largest city with 4 million inhabitants. And um, for many decades, there had been a war between the government and different uh, non-state actors. Um, the FARCs uh, were one of them. And um, internal displacement, displacement resulted in the creation of huge communas. It's like slums on the hillsides on each, all around the city, uh, where there are uh, a lot of... Um, uh, extreme levels of violence and um, uh, drug dealing and uh, crimes. And from 2004, the municipality launched a social urbanism strategy to city planning that used architecture as a tool to address the underlying causes of urban violence. It's now acclaimed as a success um, story because it, it offers the inhabitants of those slums, uh, the communas, um, a way to um, tackle inequality and mitigate violence um, by, by creating new possibilities in the city. You can, of course, read more about those different case, case studies um, in the full version of my thesis. For my uh, third and last case study, um, I uh, interviewed uh, Cristiania Adalgas' daughter, who was on a mission with the um, ICRC, the, in, the International Committee of the Red Cross, in Iraq in 2019. Uh, in 2019, there was a huge amount of um, returnees, uh, so people displaced people coming back to Iraq and uh, most of them settled down in their uh, usual uh, place of, of, of habitat, so in their own villages. And this um, Iraq Returnee Program um, was actually a pilot pro project that provided an alternative to traditional reconstruction approaches by supporting target communities in the self-reconstruction of their own houses. So it was a very holistic and multidisciplinary approach that supported entrepreneurship, so the local market, and gave a specific attention to vulnerable groups. 
So this was very quick, but now my findings. So I had the literature review, uh, three different domains and three different case studies. And that led me to find that post-conflict reconstruction processes can activate the local economy, they can create cohesion, and they are able to link immediate relief uh, with longer term development. So that's this um, humanitarian development peace nexus. It, con it can contribute to community building and self-sustaining peace. Now the architect skills, which skills do they have? They understand the local context and they understand the culture. They know how to involve the local communities in participatory processes. They know how to collaborate and operate in multidisciplinary teams. Uh, they have an overview or an understanding of the psychological aspects uh, of the housing process. And of course, they um, know how to combine practical solution with aesthetical and symbolic value. And uh, as a conclusion, the, approximate, the appropriate use of those skills have the potential to contribute to the relevancy and the sustainability of post-conflict reconstruction projects. It uh, can instill dignity and, and give opportunities for a positive change. And it can bring people together to create social bonds and support holistic approaches to peace building. In the need for further research, I could say that I observed that more attention should be given by the humanitarian community to the reconstruction of the built environment in general. And more particularly, there is a need for trans transdisciplinary research on the link between the social role of architects in crisis settings and the field of peace building and post-war reconstruction. Uh, this is a complex but passionating, passionating topic that I try to outline in my thesis. Thank you.